all around the world, men and women, people of all ages, have witnessed the awesome manifestation of God's presence, power, and His love rendered in words, words beyond the written pages. Why are we preaching like this? Why do we travel all around the world preaching the gospel? Because Jesus is coming again. And he left us with a message to tell the untold. A message for the whole world. This message of faith in God and his unfailing word has brought about change in the lives of millions around the world. An improvement that brings many more to such meetings with the man of God, knowing that their lives will never be the same again. Today we bring you excerpts from a special meeting with our man of God, Pastor Chris. Pastor Chris, worth hearing. Life is spiritual. Success or failure would depend on who you are and what you know. Human life is controlled from the realm of the spirit, whether or not you know it. There are too many questions that man has no answers to. The reason is this, man is a spirit. And because man is a spirit, he must participate in the realm of the spirit because he's natively spiritual. So there are things that you must do because life is spiritual. Glory to God. I'm here for two major reasons. The first one, is to impart something to you. <laughs> because you see, life is spiritual. And I'm gonna start talking about that in a moment. The second reason is what we call capacity building. The Bible tells us that God does increase the grace on one's life. He can and he does it. Not many are aware that in the realm of the spirit, there are certain things that must be done. You know, after you've given your heart to Christ, that's just the beginning of your journey. That's where you start. For a lot of people, they think that that's all there is about it. Many are not aware that the kingdom of God works in a certain way. You, you receive salvation. You receive Christ to live in you. You receive the Holy Spirit to live in you. The kingdom of God works in your spirit, in your life. But there are things that you must do. There are things that you must do. Life is spiritual. Tell somebody life is spiritual. Life is spiritual. You know, a lot of people don't know that. You know, so just recently, who we were ministering to the sick at the healing school, I met a gentleman a medical doctor bound in his wheelchair, been in that condition for several years. Couldn't do anything for himself. But a medical doctor 
How can you explain it? Why would he be in such a situation after knowing everything that he'd come to know in medicine? Why would he be there? Because life is spiritual. I knew a gentleman, very intelligent young man, very intelligent. And uh, he was, the sky was so bright. He had the best results in school. I had a first class, moved on for his master's and was doing his PhD. He had been the best everywhere. Then, this spiritual condition got a hold of him. He had no answer. They took him to the best doctors because the guy was so bright. And they didn't want to lose him. These are the kind of guys you, you, you plan for and say, look, our country is going to have something in the future. We got this guy. But sickness got a hold of him. The best doctors couldn't help him. They took him from one hospital to the other. There was no solution. He had been a Christian. But he had become so intelligent that he didn't need God anymore. He was so intelligent, so smart. I met him and I said to him, life is spiritual. I said, life is spiritual. You don't have a solution to your problem now. What you have to do is turn around and get back to where you left off. Life is spiritual. Tell two people, life is spiritual. Yes, life is spiritual. Life is spiritual. Human life is controlled from the realm of the spirit, whether or not you know it. It doesn't matter whether or not you know it. It's influenced and controlled from the realm of the spirit. And to remain ignorant of that is to fool oneself. There are too many questions that man has no answers to. Read your history. History tells us that Israel was in Egypt. History tells us. Now, for those of you who know your history very well, you know, according to the history books, that Israel was in Egypt for many years. And then they came out of Egypt. Question, by what laws did they cross the Red Sea? Six million Jews. How did they cross the Red Sea? Forty years, forty years in the wilderness. Forty years. And their shoes grew on their feet. When they left Egypt, they took a spoil. If you were five years old when you left Egypt, you had shoes for a five-year-old. They were there 40 years in the wilderness. When you were 25, you still had those shoes. And the shoes grew with them. Read your Bible. It says there was not one feeble person among their tribes. No grandmother had to be supported. No grandpa had to be carried. Everybody was strong. By what law? In the wilderness. 
I asked you a question, how did they cross the Red Sea? Tell me. You know, one time there was a guy who thought he was so smart, and he said, the area, the part of the sea that they crossed was only two feet deep. He forgot something that the Bible says, that when Pharaoh's soldiers, Pharaoh's army, horses and chariots, think about that, went through the same place, they drowned. How could they have drowned in water two feet deep? I've not even quoted the Bible yet. I said, history tells us. We know from history that they went out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea. My question is, by what law? How did he do it? Tell somebody, life is, <laughs> life is spiritual. It is. It is. It is. So, the first point that I made to you, I said uh, to impart spiritual gifts, spiritual abilities. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. And from verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, and that's why I came, praise God. And you can see it right there. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end ye may be established. You become unshakable. Producing results. Hallelujah. You be successful in everything. Once you are involved in it, it will succeed. Because we are special. We are special. The Bible says that we are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. That means separated and sanctified. A peculiar, unique people. Praise God forevermore. Yeah. Book of James. Chapter 4. Read verse 6 for me. Did you see that? He gives what? More grace. God gives more grace. And he gives that grace to the humble. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. He gives more grace. He gives you grace and he adds to it and he adds to it and he adds to it. You know, if you have the ability to run a business that uh, makes 300,000 rands a year and you want to move from that to 3 million rands a year, what you need is more grace. The grace. See, an increased grace. Because if you don't get more grace, it doesn't matter that they give you a lot of money. You lose it and go back to your 300,000. See, people are limited. 
by the ability that they have in them that can work through them. See what I mean by capacity building? It's spiritual. You know the world is in a chaotic condition right now. They don't know what to do. They're confused about the economies of the world. They're not sure what to do. They're trying this and trying that and trying this theory and trying the other theory. And the more they try, the worse it gets. Well, the Bible already showed us the future of this world. And if you know your Bible well, nothing happening today will be a surprise to you because you're just like you're reading it already. It's in the Word. It's in the Word. We know the future of this world. And things didn't get here as a surprise. For those of us who've been reading the Bible for many years, the world is in the place we thought it would be many years ago. No surprise at all. No surprise at all. Hallelujah. They don't have the solution. The Bible tells us gross darkness will cover the world. Spiritual darkness. Economic darkness. And people are looking for Solution for their health, and they look into government for the health programs. Everyone's looking to some better government, and the more they throw one government out, one administration out, and get another one in, the worse it gets. And then they kick that one out and say, you're, you're terrible, get out. We'll elect another one. And that one gets worse. And then they kick that one out, and then they bring in another one. And then we just keep listening. And the politicians are getting wiser and wiser. They now know how to make us vote for them. Just tell them a little lie. It won't hurt. Just lie a little to them. Tell them what you're going to do. It's all around the world. Why? Because they don't have the solution. They're trying. It's not working. Why? Life is what? Spiritual. Life is spiritual. The reason is this, man is a spirit. And because man is a spirit, he can only be controlled from the realm of the spirit. And he must participate in the realm of the spirit because he's natively spiritual. He's a spirit being. Now, just because you are ignorant or unconscious of electrical laws, Will that change the result? It won't change the result. You don't have to know anything about electrical laws. If you get in their way, they will hurt you. Just because you know nothing of gravity doesn't mean you jump off the balcony that you're going to remain in the air. That law will bring you down. It's so hard you... Well... <laughs> see... So whether or not you're conscious or ignorant of a spiritual law, it makes no difference. It'll work anyhow. It'll work for you or against you. Just as much as electrical laws will work for you or against you, depending on your application of them. If you apply them rightly, be to your advantage. Wrongly, they hurt you. Spiritual laws are exactly the same. Now, just because you've been ignorant of spiritual laws doesn't mean they're not there and it doesn't mean they're not working and doesn't mean that they will be quiet for you. No, they work for you or against you. So the sooner you realize that, the better. Glory to God. How many of you read of King David? Do you ever read of King David? He was one of the greatest kings that ever lived. Hallelujah. And God bore testimony of him in the scriptures. And Jesus 
spoke concerning David. And so we know not only is the story of David true, but that he was such a remarkable character. And the Word of God says so much about him, we've got to study him. Why was he so successful? He won every battle he went to, every war he won. Israel never lost a battle in David's day. The only one in which they were defeated partially was the one he didn't attend. He was not there. Rightly or wrongly, but he was not there. When he got ready, he whipped them again. He won every battle. How could a man be so successful to never lose? I like to think like such a man. I like to know how to win always and never lose. The, the people who are used to winning and losing and winning and losing, they say, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. And they say, how's business? Well, you know how business is. And sometimes you gain and sometimes you lose. <laughs> They're so used to this kind of life. Sometimes you're healthy and sometimes you're sick. You know, life for them is just ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. That's not the way it should be. That's not the way. You know, when I tell people, I've never suffered in my life, they find it hard to understand. Because maybe in their lives they've been used to a lot of suffering. I got a hold of God's word while I was still very young. I began to learn and understand the scriptures while I was still very young. That helped me. Because when the challenges of life, when the crisis of life came, I won every time. I had learned the laws of the Spirit. I had learned how to take my stand in the things of God. I had learned. And I found out you can always and you should always win. You know, when people wonder about that, I get to wonder about them. Because then I wonder, oh, what did you learn about Jesus? What kind of a man was he? How was Jesus? Was he a winner or a loser? Always a winner. Always victorious. And he gave us that life. The reason he was always victorious wasn't because of uh, some help that he got. It was because of who he was. Who he was and what he knew. Success or failure would depend on who you are and what you know. If you are what you are and you don't know about it and you don't know what to do with it, you fail too. You fail and you'll be wondering why. And that's the reason many Christians don't understand why things aren't working for them. So they got to blame the church or blame their pastor or blame some other fellow or blame their brothers and sisters in Christ. Blame somebody for their problem. The problem was they didn't know what to do. God said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge. Spiritual knowledge. True knowledge. See, you want more grace in your life. That will increase the capacity to perform. Your ability to perform. The speed in your life. The accuracy in your life. All of this will be increased by grace. When you have more grace, there'll be more ability, more favor, 
more accuracy. More speed. And then you become a wonder to your generation. Others will not cease to wonder about you. How does he do it? How does she do it? That's the grace of God. You know, a lot of people think that grace is that thing that we don't, we don't, we, we got nothing to do with it. We just wait and we hope that grace might locate us. And we just hope that somehow or another, God in his infinite mercy would look down on us and say, hmm, I feel good today. I'll give you some grace. But that's not the way it works. Let's read something. Second Peter chapter 1. We begin from verse 1. Y'all read it now. Want to go. Mm -hmm. Go on. Ah, did you see that? Stop. He says grace and peace. Notice he doesn't even say be added. He says be multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This knowledge is a special kind of knowledge. This is not the introductory knowledge where you come to receive Christ as Lord of your life. No. That's ginosko. Are you hearing this? This knowledge is epignosis. It is accurate, special, and specialized knowledge. This knowledge is a knowledge of relationship. It is experiential knowledge. It's a special kind of knowledge. Knowledge that relates with that which is known. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the epignosis of God. That means it's, it's up to you. That means you can multiply the grace of God that is in your life. You can make it happen. You're not going to be praying, oh God, add more grace. Oh God, add more grace. No, he shows you what to do to multiply God's grace in your life and the peace of God in your life. He says grace and peace, grace and peace. That means power over crisis, grace and power over crisis. That means in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the storm, you are full of peace. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the epignosis of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Multiply the grace of God in your life. This is your job. It's your responsibility. If you don't do it, nothing will be done. You're just going to stay with the same ability you had 10 years ago. And if that ability is not increased, you can't do more. Like somebody said, all you can do is all you can do. I can call. All you can do is all you can do until something supernatural happens. Glory to God. And then you can do more because there'll be more, more ability. It's the same thing in leadership, pastoring. You can be a pastor of 2,000 people. And that's where it stops. Even if 500 new people come to your church, somehow 500 others will go away. You remain in 2,000 members continually. You just don't know why. You're winning souls. You're laboring. You're bringing more people in. But the church doesn't just increase. see it? And that can be a problem. And they're laboring. And they're trying. 
They just don't get it. That you've got to multiply the grace of God in your life. You need increased grace. This is what you need. And thanks be unto God, we don't have to stay somewhere crying and begging for it. We can do something about it. Amen. See, we are sons of God. We're not beggars. We're sons of God. He shows us what to do. Somebody said, give me no fish. Teach me to fish so I can stand on my own. Isn't that better? Yeah. Let me show you something. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. Read verse 21. Keep yourselves from what? Idols. Many people don't understand why Africa has the kind of problems that it has. Most of the world left idolatry a long time ago. Most of Africa refused to quit idolatry. Idolatry is the father of poverty. People don't understand. I said life is spiritual. Idolatry is the father of poverty. As long as you're connected to idolatry, poverty cannot leave you. It doesn't matter what prosperity comes your way. In the process of time, it will leave you. And you go back to where you came from. Except the laws of the spirit are applied to break you free from idolatry. John is talking to God's people. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. You are a member of the church. You are a leader in the church. When it's a special weekend, you are back to the village for traditional celebration. <laughs> Idolatrous celebration. That means you will be in bondage to Satan for so long. That means poverty will follow you. It doesn't matter. Even if they put you on top of the central bank, all the money will go away. Keep yourselves from idols. Idolatry is a problem of many people in Africa. And many times it affects certain people in the church. It affects certain people in the church, inside the house of God. It says keep yourselves from idols. Let me show you a scripture. Second Corinthians. Chapter 10. Let's start from verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, that means though we walk in the human body, okay? All right? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. He says there's a war going on, and it's not a fleshly war. The trouble you are having is not your mother-in-law. The trouble you are having is not your next door neighbor. The trouble you are having is not that guy that hates you in the office. The reason for your lack of promotion is not because XYZ hates you, doesn't like you, and has chosen not to promote you. The Bible says promotion doesn't come from the east or west. It doesn't come from the south comes from God Amen. doesn't matter who is in office if God promotes you they better comply he says for though we walk in the flesh though we live in this physical body and move around in this physical body he says we are not engaged in the fleshly warfare Read more. Verse 4. For the, oh boy, look at that. For the weapons, 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not man-made. They're not of human understanding. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are strongholds? Strongholds are not metal barriers. Strongholds are not steel platforms or uh, steel walls. No, it's not talking about those high walls. Strongholds are ideas in your head. Theories that you have accepted in life to keep you from moving in the direction that God wants you to go. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not cannot but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Those strongholds can only be pulled down by the power of God's spirit. The weapons of our warfare. Because those ideas have been built into your mind by satanic forces. Why do you reject tithing, for example? Even though you have heard of the blessings and the promises of the tither. Yet you refuse to tithe. Why? Strongholds in your mind. Strongholds. You just can't free yourself to accept the idea. Even though you know it's true. You keep arguing against it. Why are you against offering? The same reason. Strongholds. Strongholds. With the little chunk change you have, you can have, nobody's going to take this money from me. And no one has taken it from you. They have left you with it and you are not any better. But you can't see it. You look at the promise of God that says the tither will be blessed. You are not getting blessed. You hold on to that and say, no, I will never release it. Don't release it. Why are you where you are? Strongholds. Strongholds in your mind. Nothing is given to you to do that works. Why? The ideas in your head. Have you ever seen someone who doesn't have anything to be proud of, but he's very proud? You know, a lot of people think that pride is something that has to do with rich, rich and powerful people. No, poor people can be very proud. <laughs> ah, a poor man can buy. A poor man can buy a brand new bicycle. That's all he can afford. And then, with this new bicycle, every time he wants to ride it, he say, my neighbors are jealous in me now. <laughs> bicycle! He looks at his neighbors and says, they are jealous in me. So the reason my neighbors are against me is because of the new bicycle I bought. Hey, look. He didn't have to have a Ferrari to know that somebody is jealous of him for his bicycle. Tell somebody life is spiritual. <laughs> Why is he like that? Strongholds in his mind. Strongholds in his mind. Built in there by satanic powers all his life. He's been exposed to the wrong things. Now he's grown up. Those ideas have formed something in him. And he can understand why he thinks like that. But I can because it's in the word. I can see it. I can see why he thinks like that. Let's read more. You're, you're in verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations. Those imaginations cannot leave your mind until the power of God brings them down. Why do you continue to imagine divorce? Why? Why? Why are you imagining yourself having that divorce? Why? Why are you imagining how to steal? Why? Why have you been imagining how to rob a car? Why? Why has it been in your mind? How to kill somebody? Why? And now you are a captive of your evil imaginations. Why? The only way is the weapons of our warfare. They are mighty through God. The casting down of imaginations. Imaginations. 
A guy took a gun, went downstairs, killed his mother and his father. Killed the two of them. Why? He'd been watching the film. And he heard a voice that told him, it's time to do it. He'd been imagining it. Imagining it until he got a hold of him. And he acted it out. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. For what? Casting down imaginations. Evil, wicked imaginations. Why did that fellow go to school the other day with a gun which he stole from his neighbor's house? Went to the class, killed the teacher, and killed several classmates. How old was he? Fourteen. Fourteen. Killed the teacher, killed several classmates. Imaginations. He had been thinking. He had been imagining this evil. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? The day that child who killed the mother. A guy who killed the mother. Young boy. Killed the mother. And after he did it. They didn't know what to do with him. Too young, eight years old. What did they do? The day he was born, mother and everybody was happy. They didn't know they were carrying what was going to kill them. <laughs> everybody was happy. New baby is born. But this was the one to kill the mother. The mother didn't know what she was carrying. I said, life is what? Spiritual. Put that scripture up again. Verse 5. Read verse 5. Read verse 5. Mm -hmm. He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's the only way it will happen. Through the weapons of our warfare. To bring your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. To help you submit your thoughts, submit your mind to Christ. Hallelujah. Turn to Psalm 119. Let me show you some things here. Read verse 19. Hallelujah. Hear David. Smart fellow. Smart fellow. He knew what to ask God for. Look at that. Read it now. Hallelujah. He looked at the whole world. Smart man. He says, oh God, I'm a stranger in the earth. Don't hide your commandments from me. Don't hide your commandments from me. Why? Look at verse 105. Same book, same chapter. Verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light onto my path. The word of God is a lamp for your feet. To walk through this world. To charge your course through this world. is a light for your paths. Verse 66. Same book. Same chapter. Read. I'm touched. I'm touched. He says, teach me good judgment and knowledge. You know what this man is talking about here? 
He says, for I have believed thy commandments. It's not enough to believe. Somebody says, well, I already believe. What else do you want from me? There's more. There's more. Because you want the word of God to work for you. There's more. He says, teach me good judgment. Good judgment. How to discern what is right from what is wrong. How to discern what is of God and what is not of God. How to discern the principles of the spirit realm. He says, teach me good judgment and knowledge. Teach me knowledge. You know what the man is saying? Spiritual knowledge. You know, sometimes I look at certain people and some things that do. As if you knew the word of God, you wouldn't do that. You know, Jesus said, you err because you know not the scriptures. You err because you know not the scriptures. There are things people do that put them in bondage, that destroy the work of their hands, and they don't know why. Because they're ignorant. One of the things you must not take lightly is church attendance. I'll tell you. Going to church is so important for you. It is so, so important that it must be for you a priority. Because the Bible says that the church, and it's talking about the local church, there it is the ground and pillar of truths. There you make it possible for the ministry of the Spirit in your life. You make it possible for the Holy Spirit to bring you knowledge and understanding and judgment, sound judgment. I feel sorry for that man or woman who thinks that going to church is not important. Are you still here? Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hmm. Look at that scripture again. Verse 66. Let's, let's read it. We're going to read it into the next verse. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. I have believed thy commandments. I have believed. Now, teach me good judgment and knowledge. Teach me good judgment. How to say what I should say and say it rightly. When to say it. You can say the right thing and say it wrongly and get into trouble. He says, teach me good judgment. Let me judge correctly. Six to seven. Before, oh boy. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Can you see it? Before your trouble began, you already went astray. That's why the lashes of life came on your back. Look at that. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I was afflicted with that cancer, I went astray. Before I was afflicted in my job, I went astray. Where did you go astray? Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. You see, he's corrected himself. But there are those who haven't corrected themselves. They haven't judged rightly. They haven't realized that the problem they're having is because they went astray. It is before I was afflicted. Because when the anointing comes on your life by the presence of the Holy Spirit, you are separated from affliction. The Bible says the son of wickedness shall not afflict him. And so why would you now find yourself being afflicted because you went astray? It's not hard to know when things go terrible for people. It's not hard. Their language changes. You can, you can hear it in their language. The way they talk. 
Their priorities change. They reorder their priorities. And the things of the world, the things of the flesh, become their dominant theme. That's what they want. Glory to God. Now, what you do with the word of God after you have received salvation is very important. What you do with it. The word of God has been given to you. You have received salvation. You are a child of God. Now you're on your way. Okay. But what do you do with the word of God that has been given to you? What do you do with it? And what is it doing in your life? I said to people, uh, progress in your life should be all around. If, for example, you're making progress in your business and it's not showing in your spiritual life, something is wrong. And something is going to go wrong very soon with that business. See, because the life of it has been neglected. The real life has been neglected. Now somebody says, what if you're making progress spiritually and you're not making progress in your business? It's not possible. It's not possible. You may be defining spiritual progress wrongly. You can't be making progress spiritually and not be making progress every other way. No, 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 no. A thousand times no. I'll show you something just now. Maybe I should show you right away. Hmm. Ah, 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 ah. Are you there? Okay. Romans chapter 12. Let's just look at this. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Simple scripture. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. How does that work with you? You're growing spiritually. Are you blessing them that persecute you? Or are you saying, Father, in the name of Jesus... Are you destroying them in the spirit? <laughs> are you testifying that things are going wrong with your enemies? Is that what he said? He said, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. That's spiritual growth. Go to the next verse. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Okay. Now you heard that... Uh, your colleague, in fact, you just saw uh, an invitation letter for a, a wedding invitation. <laughs> you're looking at the wedding inv invitation. Somebody expects that you're going to be, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, you know why you're crying? What about me? <laughs> and you say you are growing spiritually because you're shouting in the church. How is that spiritual growth? Are you rejoicing with the owner of that card? No! Someone has informed you that he just got double promotion. They increased his salaries, promoted him. So uh, they even gave him a new house, a new car. And then instead of saying, praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't understand. What don't you understand? Oh, I don't understand. You don't understand. I've been serving God. I've been serving God. I've been faithful to God. All I've had God for is just one new job and he hasn't done it. And you call yourself growing spiritually. Look at that. Rejoice with them that rejoice. You are not rejoicing. You are angry. then nobody knows why things are not moving in your life because they think you are very spiritual. Because every time you're in church, oh, 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 I love you, Lord. Yeah. They don't know how angry you are with the Lord. But they see you and they believe you are doing so well. 
They even tell you they wish they could be like you. <laughs> but that simple scripture, you have not fulfilled it. Somebody said one time, you know, I was sharing the word of God, and, and the fellow said, there are so many things to do. Can someone ever really please God? I said, it's not a problem, let me tell you. God didn't say, go and start looking for it so you can do it. He wants the word of God to live in you. That's what he wants. Meditate on the word and the word will live through you. That's what you need. When you meditate on the word, it will sink into your spirit and become a part of you. And live through you. Express the kingdom of God through you. You won't have to be trying to make that effort. No. It's your nature. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. He didn't say, thy word have I focused on trying to follow it. No. He said, thy word have I hid in my heart. See, put the word in you. Make a deposit of the word into your spirit. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you in abundance. Richly. Let the word dwell in you. That's what you need. Get it into your system. How? By meditation. This is one of the good ways to do that. You're hearing the word now. You're listening to it. You're imbibing it. Get it into you. Let it get in. Don't argue with the word. You know, there are people who always argue with the word. Strongholds. You remember? Strongholds. They got the strongholds. Keeping them from doing the word of God. They're always arguing. Even when there's nothing to argue about, they get tired, they just look for one. <laughs> they found one. They heard people talking over there, so they've come to join them. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> it doesn't concern them. What, what are you talking about? And then he gets in on it, and the next thing you know, there's an argument. There are just some people who have fight anywhere. Everywhere they have worked, they fought with somebody. So why are you like this? You fight everywhere. He doesn't know why. Strongholds. He has a way of reasoning. And until those shackles are destroyed, he'll be in captivity without realizing that he's in captivity. That's the problem about spiritual bondage. Those in spiritual bondage a lot of times don't even know where they are. Because with spiritual bondage comes spiritual blindness and deafness. So they don't see and they don't hear. Because Satan has kept them in that situation. But true knowledge shall the just be delivered. Praise the Lord. You still there? Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right, let me show you another simple scripture. All right? This one is very simple. You like it because most of you quote it. All right. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Have you seen it? Let's go. But if the spirit, oh dear Lord Jesus, this is a marvel. I want you to notice it. Look at it. It says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. All right, now let's look at something. What have we done with that scripture? We've made a song out of it. We've made our... Uh, we've, we, we've meditated in such a way as to only have the quotes. So we can recite it anytime. Anytime. In the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. We can say it. What have we done with it? I want to show you something. 
John 3.16. Okay, let's start. Want to go? Uh Uh-huh. Thank you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that anybody who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I tell people, um, do you believe? The word says that anybody who believes There's a decree, the sovereign decree of God that anybody who believes should not perish. It's a decree. God said anybody who believes should not perish, but have. So he says, he that believeth in him has everlasting life. Now, most Christians keep quoting it. All right? They haven't come to the believing part so they believe without receiving so i say to them do you believe in jesus oh yes i do what did you get when you believed then they start scratching their heads they haven't thought about it how about you said he that believes has everlasting life so if you believe that means you have So you are more than a believer now. You're a haver. You you, you get it? You've transited from the believer. That's what you see. We call ourselves believers. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. That's a journey that doesn't end. You believed to have. Believing was the verb to take you to the having. Why are you still believing? I'm believing God for a car. I'm believing God for a new house. I'm believing God for, I'm believing, believing, believing? Your believing is still a journey? When are you going to have what you believe for so that you stop believing but having? Come on, do you get something there? See, because most of them have never been taught that when they believed, they received something. So that we are not sitting there as believers, but as those who actually have something. Come on here. Are you getting it? We've got to be conscious of what we got from our believing. When you believed, you got something. Believing was like the check. You brought the check and they gave you the money. You get it? Or you paid for that product and they gave it to you. Now you have it. The check is no longer there with you. You paid. You, you have the product now. Why are you still believing? Are you following it? Now, let me show you that scripture. Go back to that scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Let me show it to you now. You've quoted it for so long, but I want to take you into the reality of it. But, you know, uh, some time ago, the Spirit of God spoke to me. And he said, I want you to show my people how to use the word. And so, I got up and I when showing them how to use the word. I thought that's what I've been doing. He said, yes, in part. He says, there's a greater one. Take them to this greater level. And that's what I'm doing. Look at this scripture very well now. Can you see it? Can you see this scripture? Okay, let's go. He says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also Quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Okay. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you. Question, does he live in you? And you say, yes, he does. Okay, good. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also 
vitalize, quicken, give life to your mortal bodies. When will he do it? You quoted it last year. You quoted it five years ago. You quoted it earlier this year. You are still quoting it. Okay, when will it be fulfilled? lives in you. He says, he will vitalize, make alive your mortal body. Not by another spirit, but by his spirit that lives in you. He will make your body come alive. He says, your dead doomed body, your mortal body will come alive by the Holy Ghost that lives in you. Question, when will he do it? When will he do it? You haven't heard me yet. Did you hear what I said? Yes, we just read it. He said, if the spirit of him that raised the dead body of Jesus to life, if that spirit lives in you, he will vitalize your mortal body. when will he do it? You see, because a lot of us don't know how that strongholds, ideas in our minds that have kept us from seeing the reality of God's word. And we live in the realm of promises without realizing that's what we're doing. That same spirit will vitalize my mortal body. I said it five years ago. I, five years later, I'm still talking about my mortal body. But I thought it was vitalized when I realized it five years ago. When you found out about it, it became real. But you are still saying it. You are still saying it will vitalize. He will vitalize your mortal body. I thought he already, if he vitalized, made a life, gave life to your mortal body. That means your mortal body came alive. Can you see why we can't understand why the headaches, colds, fever, why we are still subject to these elements of the world? We still don't understand it because somehow, in a subtle way, we are still living in the realm of promises, whereas the promises were fulfilled in Christ Jesus. He said if he lives in you, he will vitalize. If he lives in you, the question is when? Well, when he took up his abode in the quarters of my body, he gave life to my physical body. And I've come alive. Oh, glory to God. That's what Paul knew. That's why when the serpent bit him, he wasn't moved. He shook it into the fire and went on with his own business. Shout amen, somebody. We've come alive. Are you hearing me? So that spirit has made my body live. He's come alive in my body. So I shouldn't describe a model body anymore. The Bible says he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Hallelujah. You know, several years ago, they bundled me to the hospital because I was in bad shape. I think about, uh, must have been about um, 18, 18, 18 years or 19 years old. I was in the hospital 10 days. I said in the name of Jesus, 
Oh, Satan can't get me to say I'm sick. I'm still not sick. My body was, I said, you can't get me to say I'm sick. I'm still not sick. Ay, 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 ay. I refuse to be sick. I didn't care. I was going to have the word of God in my mouth. Hallelujah. A few years later, they carried me again to the doctor. Pastor Ken on one side, my wife on the other. They took me to the doctor. I still said, I'm not sick. I sat in front of the doctor. The doctor said, how are you? I said, fine. <laughs> well, he knew something was wrong now. How could they bring him in like this and say, it's fine? No, I wasn't feeling fine at all. I said, there's no sickness in my body. He said, we'll do a test. They tested here and there, here and there, and they came out, nil, nil, nil. They said, okay, let's go home. I said, but I'm feeling so terrible. They took me to another doctor. Put me on the stretcher. Checked everything. Put something in my ears, my nostrils, my eyes. are looking into everything. Now he couldn't find nothing. Then he put his hand on his waist. Looked at my wife and looked at me and he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. He said, oh. He said, those people don't rest. He said, that's their problem. So what you have to do, go and rest. Go and sleep. I said, sleep, I couldn't sleep for a week. He said, you sleep. Now you want to hear the rest of the story. Look at the way you're listening. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is, it doesn't matter how you feel. Put the word of God in front of you. Turn not to the left, not to the right. Maintain your focus. Stay in there. Because the word of God will put you over. Can you shout amen, somebody? the word. You said, devil, throw your best shot. Hey. Throw your best shot. I'm still a child of God. You know, I love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. They said, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we will not part. They said, our God is able to deliver us out of your fire. But if he doesn't, we still will not bow. Oh, God! I like that. That's commitment to the word of God. I refuse to be sick. Doesn't matter how I feel, you still will not get me to say I'm sick. Hey! Because it says, they that live therein, they that dwell in Zion, shall not say, I am sick. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, dear Lord. That same spirit has vitalized my body. You see, we've got to understand the difference. Remember, Isaiah said, Isaiah said, looking forward to the cross and prophetic vision, he said, and by his stripes, we are healed. Peter, after Jesus had come to fulfill it, looked back at the cross and he said, by whose stripes you were healed. That spirit living in me, the scripture said, if he lives in you, he will vitalize your mortal body. 
I saw it. I found the Spirit of God lived in me. I found the Spirit of God put it to work and he vitalized my body. Now I look back and I say, that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead took up his abode in the quarters of my body and vitalized my body. So it's past tense. He did. He made my body come alive with the life of God. So now I say, Father, I have the life and nature of God in me, in my spirit, in my soul, and in my body. And one of these days when he shows up, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Can you shout amen, somebody? And we're waiting. Who knows? One day very soon, the last service would have been held. One day very soon, the last rosa would have been organized. Are you hearing me? One day very soon, the last conference would have held. And then suddenly, 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 a sound from heaven, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Hallelujah. And we that are alive and remain shall be caught up. Oh, glory to God. Ma, 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 ma. Give him a shout of praise. 